All right, everyone, I am here with Alexander Richard. Alexander is a research scientist with Facebook Reality Labs. Alexander, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely, really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, let's get started by having you share a little bit about your background. How'd you come to work in machine learning? <laughs> That is basically just a chain of coincidences. I was never <laughs> planning to do this. I was planning to study music, but you know, in order to have a music? good career. Yeah, but in order to have a good career, you know, you need to be extraordinary, which I am not, let's face it. <laughs> so it was like, that was my backup plan. And like in the first semester at university, it was in Germany at a university where they had a big institute for speech recognition. And there was before smartphones were big, before there was Alexa, before there was Siri. And they had like this open house one day, and you know, free food, free drinks. As a poor student, of course, you go there. And they had this demo where you could talk into a microphone and the words that you said would just magically appear on the screen. And it was like, wow, I was flashed by that. That was amazing. So that was probably the point when I decided I really want to go into machine learning and this is exactly what I want to do. So I basically stayed at this institute until I got my master's for like uh, four or five years and uh -huh. then changed to computer vision for the PhD and randomly ran to some guy I cited a lot because he was doing the PhD in the same topic that I did. And he was like, you know, I graduated. I'm at Facebook now. We're looking for interns. It's a slightly different field than what you're doing, but don't you want to join? I was like, I'm never going to leave Europe or Germany, but well, for an internship, why not? So I came to Pittsburgh. I joined this lab and it was, again, an amazing experience. Like the first time that I could really see that with my education, I can work on something that can potentially change the way we communicate and really have a big impact on uh, on people's lives. And that was so exciting that I completely made up my mind. And half a year later, I was like, okay, I graduate and I want to go back to Facebook. That was a great project, a great time, and you work with great people. So that's, that's awesome. how I ended up here. Super random. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about Facebook Reality Labs. I'm assuming there's some kind of CMU connection given uh, Pittsburgh? <laughs> I mean... There are a lot of uh, industry labs in Pittsburgh, probably due to CMU. Our director, Yasser Shaikh, used to be a CMU professor. Okay. I think that's the origin of it all. And that's also the origin how Facebook Reality Labs came to the city. Um, yeah, I mean, the lab is all about social telepresence, right? So um, our, our mission, so to say, is, well, if we would have succeeded already, then we wouldn't have this conversation over video conferencing, right? We, You wouldn't be a small rectangle in my big room. I wouldn't be a small rectangle in your big room, but we would both be wearing a virtual reality headset and we would standing right next to each other and having this conversation in 3D, in virtual reality, in mm. a shared space. And mm -hmm. that is really the promise and the mission of this lab that we try to accomplish, which I believe is super exciting. And as I said, which is like this one thing that can really be a big leap forward in the way how we connect over the distance, which in my view makes it so exciting to be part of that. Nice. And is the lab, uh, what's the relationship between uh, the Facebook Reality Lab and the Oculus? Yeah, I mean, it emerged from uh, Oculus. Okay. Uh, it used to be Oculus Research, actually, at the time when okay. I interned there, and then transitioned into Facebook Reality Labs, which is now the big branch, which is looking into VR and AR at Facebook. Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your your research interests. Yeah, we're going to be talking uh, in particular about uh, one of your papers, Neural Synthesis of Binaural Speech from Mono Audio, which uh, was an ICLR Best Paper Award winner. Um, but, you know, more broadly, I'd love to hear your general research interests. Right. Uh, I'm particularly interested in anything audiovisual okay. and um, particularly, you know, in generative modeling from audio and visual input. And that is like, I believe, one field that has been largely forgotten in early years of computer vision, that the visual modality always just gives you very limited information, particularly when you think about a webcam where the resolution is low or when you think about a virtual reality headset where you just have very limited sensory data. Mm -hmm. And audio is like one of these modalities that gives you a lot of cues that can fill in the gaps. So it holds like a big promise on improving whatever we developed over the last years in computer vision and really filling in what visual sensors in specific circumstances cannot give you. And I found that super exciting. So I was really starting to focus looking particularly onto how can we combine audio and vision in a generative modeling setting where we really want to generate something like 
realistic looking faces in the end. And you can imagine that this is difficult if in this specific application of virtual reality, if you wear a headset, uh, your face is partly occluded, you just cannot, cannot observe anything. Your data is always lossy. And occluding audio is a much harder task or Put in other words, mm -hmm. it's much easier to get the complete audio information that is surrounding you than to get the complete visual information. Yeah, yeah. Can you um, can you give an example that uh, you think really illustrates the you know the the ultimate power of <laughs> combining audio and, and video? Yes, uh, I think we should talk about two things there. One is clearly the sensing side. So what is the input, right? And let us take the example of a virtual reality headset. We might have a camera that is kind of facing your mouth, but it's very hard to really get good illumination of the interior of your mouth and have some accurate tongue modeling. It is very hard to get all the mouth, all the mouth closures correct. Like I have a beard, right? There, if there is a camera facing uh, towards me with a skewed angle, it is extremely hard to see every detail of my lips. But with audio, we get these details. I can't produce the P sound without closing my lips. I can't mm. produce the M sound without closing my lips. All these correlations are clearly some that we need to explore. That is like on the sensing side. But then we also work obviously on the on the output side where it comes to putting things into virtual reality. And we have these correlations between audio and vision there as well, right? I mean, I just have a single microphone here, but if we had multiple microphones and I would be snapping my finger, you should hear this from two different directions. Yeah. And there needs to be some vi audiovisual correspondence, which is frequently forgotten. It's frequently like, yeah, okay, we generate something where I am talking and I can do things with my hand, but we have mono audio in the systems. And that mm -hmm. seems like leaving out half of the signal that is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, thinking about... Uh video games that are kind of purely you know generated you know in, in many cases like uh you know it's as much a it's much more like a movie production than like a generated something that a model generates you know right. we're used to hearing kind of stereo sounds and um uh but i'm imagining that you know that's a lot more difficult when you're creating generative uh scenes from a much a model of some sort yeah, absolutely. I think one of the big problems here is that in video games, it's usually fine if you have something that is just plausible, meaning the sound is coming from the right direction and kind of fits the environment. That's all good. Same mm. for the visual part, right? Uh -huh. uh, you have a synthetic video character that doesn't necessarily authentically look like you. So plausibility is fine in video games, but for the the mission that we are pursuing, plausibility is not enough. We really want to have accuracy. We really want to represent yourself in virtual reality that your loved ones your friends people who know you are close to you can really recognize you and recognize all the subtleties in your voice in your facial experience uh that all the expressions this micro expressions that you do right mm -hmm. that needs to be there if you want to have a real social experience and that is the big difference to movies and games where you can just post process and just need to produce something that is plausible right right yeah for a long time now the kind of holy grail and AR VR is this idea of the uncanny valley. Like there's something, <laughs> there's just something wrong. Uh, I think for a long time, it's been pretty basic things. You know, the resolution of the, yes. the visor isn't high enough. Uh, I think you're pointing to, um, you know, maybe we've overcome some of those challenges and now the, the uncanny valley frontier is a lot more subtle. Is that part of it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. Uh, whenever we have social interaction, there is so much that we are trained as humans, right? So I have like decades of training, talking to people. You have a lot of training, talking to people, and we really know how a social conversation between humans works and what these subtleties are and how to interpret them. Well, let's say our mind knows, but we do not know this actively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to quantify. So how do we teach a machine to do this, to do something we cannot even quantify ourselves. And that is the massive challenge now, to go beyond the uncanny valley with the subtleties of communication. And our approach there is to, to argue that everything needs to be metric, meaning whatever we can measure in reality should be transferred like that into virtual reality. If we do that right, then automatically we will have all these subtle social cues in virtual reality as well. However, if we would resort to a solution that is only plausible, we might transfer something into virtual reality that substantially changes the meaning of what you are saying. Like, I don't know, is my smile a generally happy smile or am I being sarcastic? This is very important for our conversation, but if we misinterpret that because we generate something that is just plausible but not accurate, not metric, then 
we have a problem because we changed the meaning of conversation. Mm. I'd love to have you dig a little bit into that comment a bit more about uh, metrics and uh, having everything that you can measure in a physical world Mm -hmm. be measurable in virtual reality. The thing that, uh, the, the thought that it prompts is that there are an infinite many things that we could measure in the physical world and, uh, and to treat all of those in discrete as discrete metrics in the virtual world, and then you know try to train a model, for example, that's looking at you know so many metrics. Um, you know that's in stark contrast to the way things that it, the way things have generally been trending, which is uh, you know let's just take pixels and try to you know focus on pixels, and right. then the networks, if we can throw enough compute at them, they'll figure everything out. Can you elaborate on the, kind of the oh, way yeah. you think about that? <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Um, so when we talk about training a network, we still want to optimize a metric loss, like in standard L2 loss, what everyone else is doing in the vision community as well. When you have generative models, it's you see that frequently. When you have supervision, you optimize your L2 loss against your sure. supervised signal. So we do not really try to reinvent that. But what we are saying when we say we want to be metric means our systems have to learn from the best possible measurements, meaning... If I only give you data where you see like a snippet of my mouth and maybe images of my eyes and a mono audio signal, something we can maybe get from a headset, from a virtual reality headset, we cannot expect that we can make a realistic representation of that in virtual reality if we do not have better measurements. Meaning it all starts with accurate measurements, highly accurate measurements. So the research that we do is like you would come to Pittsburgh, you get a 3D scan of your face. And that is prior information that is accurate measurements about how your face moves. And then the next step is to take this metric information and this priors that the models have learned and take the the VR headset input. And you know, we can take these parts that are visible and transfer them into virtual reality. Mm -hmm. But there are parts that are not visible that we cannot measure while you're wearing a headset. And for this, we need the strong priors. And the strong priors is what we get from very accurate measurements in the sense that we need a kind of set of people where we have high fidelity 3D scans of facial motion, facial expressions, so that we can fill in the gaps. So, you know, whenever information is not present, how can we get the closest to reality? Well, we need some kind of prior in whatever way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you mentioned, you know, going to the the lab and getting scanned. Uh, the the paper that we'll be talking about falls under the context of this broader effort called Codec Avatars. Is that what yes. that is? That scanning process and exactly. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about the the, <laughs> the broader effort. Absolutely. The idea of Codec Avatars is that you can have a an avatar of yourself in virtual reality that looks like you, sounds like you, moves like you. Of course, not autonomously, but driven by you while you wear the headset with this lossy sensory input. And this whole promise... And when you say looks like you, we're not talking about the... I forget the name of the Apple avatars. (laughs) are cartoons. We're talking about photorealistic avatars. Exactly. Ideally indistinguishable from reality. Of course, this is a very high bar that we set for ourselves there. But we are talking about photorealistic avatars um, Mm -hmm. because... Again, the same point that I made before. If we really want to transfer and transmit all these subtleties of communication, a comic-style avatar is just not enough. There is not this very personalized, specific smirk that you might have when you smile and your very specific facial expression. So we need something that is photorealistic. And, well, the way we approach this is essentially, well, it all starts with, like, accurate data measurements. So we need enough facial data to to be able to make a high-quality 3D reconstruction in VR. We usually talk codec avatar, stands for like encoder, decoder. So when we talk about the decoder side, that is what will generate your highly realistic 3D representation in virtual reality. And that is what we try to learn from lots of data where we have lots of cameras capturing your face and then we are able to reconstruct your face in 3D. Of course, while you are being captured, you cannot do every kind of expression that you can do in reality. But what we can ask you to do is some peak expressions, some example expressions. And we know that neural networks are magnificent interpolation machines. So we feed this data into neural networks. And then if you have some facial expression that falls in between two different peaks, we can generate a very accurate and faithful representation of that specific uh, expression just from what the network has learned from the peak expressions that you can be doing. 
So this is the decoder side of codec avatars. On the encoder side, we are talking more about how can we take the sensory input from the headset, which is obviously lossy. We cannot place hundreds of cameras around you, right? Mm -hmm. How can we take this very limited data and map this to a representation where the decoder can interpret enough to reconstruct your face how it looks like? Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, this is a very challenging problem that we have on the visual and on the audio side because the data that we can collect for generating this 3D representation, well, we can have multiple cameras, et cetera, of your face, but we can never have paired data with whenever you're wearing your headset because your face is occluded by the headset. Right. Your sound might be different because, you know, you're in a massive capture stage that is loud because there is AC and stuff like that for visual captures. But then for audio captures, you might be in another room. I have high ceilings. There might be reverberation. So all these differences in the domains that we have on the input side and on what we want to generate, this poses the big problem of how can we actually connect these two parts, the encoder and the decoder. And that is one of the big challenges that... Uh, it's probably a bit deep if we want to dig into the details here for codec avatars in general, but I'm happy to answer any questions in specific if you if you want to dig deeper on that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, since you're inviting us to uh, <laughs> elaborate a little bit on the the challenges there, what makes the connection between these two the key source of challenge in this problem domain? Right. So what people have shown is that you know you have variational autoencoder, you have generative uh, adversarial networks. So if you learn a representation of data that you captured, we have shown that we can generate faithful and highly accurate representations of, for example, your face, or even of sound, if you look at what's going on in the text-to-speech community. That is extremely realistic and works extremely well. Mm -hmm. What is a bit lacking is the question if you have a noisy input for audio that could be speech with like a lot of background noise, with kids running around, with cars driving, with an AC running, for vision that is, you wear the headset, you have difficult illumination, you have varying background because you move around. And the question is, how can we use this information to really condition our models that can generate these faithful representations and still match exactly what we have seen on the sensory input? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so one way we approach this is by essentially looking at the renders in VR. So if you think about the whole pipeline, you have headset inputs, we want to decode this to some numeric representation that can be transmitted from the transmitter to the receiver. And then on the receiver side, we want to have this big network that reads this code and generates your face out of that. Question is, how do we match the code? And yeah, for that, we basically apply some standards, um, domain transfer techniques. It's based on GANs, based on, on some other techniques. Um, it is always difficult to evaluate this because a major problem is that we do not have correspondences. So how do we really know that what we represent is absolutely faithful and 100% faithful? And yeah, that is where one of the big research challenges lies for the future. And is the idea that you, you've got the headset and the headset has cameras looking in at the the eyes? And is there a, is there a research foundation that comes out of... I don't know where it would come out of, you know, biology, psychology, uh, neuropsychology that says that the eyes are uh, robust enough to tell you everything that might be happening with the face. We try to stay away from these kind of priors because, okay. as I said, there are subtleties in communication that we just cannot quantify. And even psychology or neuroscience cannot really tell us which parts of the face are important for which parts of nonverbal communication specifically. Uh -huh. So what we try is really to get the most amount of data we can get from a headset, whatever restricts us in terms, in terms of hardware. But that is our, our approach to this Got and it. not relying on something where we introduce human knowledge, which in the end might be wrong or might be biased. Right. And it's just not data driven anymore in that case. But there's, there's an assumption then that there is that relationship, the eyes, you know, we're going to look at the eyes and Absolutely. we're going to try to predict the face. And with enough data, we hope that that relationship holds. Absolutely. I mean, if you just look at the anatomy of your face, you see that some parts of your face just have more muscles, uh, can expose much more motion. And that is like areas around the lips, which are certainly, you know, harder or like more important to actually observe than your ears, which barely move at all and which mm -hmm. are very easy to just plug in from prior information that we have from you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, Tell us about the this specific paper, the the neural synthesis of neural right. speech from mono audio. 
what's the kind of what's the setting and motivation? <laughs> yeah, um, let's draw a quick line to computer vision or computer graphics. 3D neural rendering is big in that field for years and has led to massive improvements. And for some reason, audio was kind of lacking behind that, right? So when you look at like how do you do specialist audio in computer games and movies, it is all breaking down to linear time invariant systems. You have some filters that you measure in an idealized anechoic setup. Um, and then you just like stack a bunch of linear filters on top of each other and get some plausible reconstruction. And we wondered why this is the case and why we do not follow the same route that computer graphics is going, where you have some 3D renderers that you can train end to end from data because that is ultimately what we want, right? If we want to represent reality, we do not want to have a linear function that is as close as possible, but we want to have data that we can measure and that we can optimize against. And that was basically the premise we started this work with. And it was kind of interesting to see, first of all, to see how much better traditional signal processing and audio processing is compared to how good traditional computer graphics methods were, right? So if you look at a traditional render of a computer graphics method, traditional face renders, you had facial models that were crude approximations and were really looking uncanny. And if you look at results, like recent progress in neural rendering, that looks super realistic. Mm -hmm. In audio, it seems that this gap was much smaller, probably because audio is well understood on a mathematical way, has less uncertainty in it inherently. Mm -hmm. But we were still figuring that um, there is... There is this stack of linear transformations that you do in signal processing that can gradually introduce more and more errors. And you always make assumptions. You always make an assumption that your room behaves in a very specific way. You make assumptions yeah. that your ears behave in a very specific way in the way you know how they modify sound. And that is not really true. Let me tell you about a funny experiment we did initially. We used binaural microphones that we stuck into the ears of a colleague of mine, and he was just walking around and recording sound. And then I was putting on my headphone and listening to that recording. And because our two ear shapes were so different, to me, it always sounded as if it was coming from behind my head. Mm. And that was clearly not the case in reality. So there is clearly something where this traditional signal processing based approaches reach their limits. And if we have a data driven approach, we can really learn something from evidence, from data, and do not have to make modeling assumptions. And we could show in this paper that we can really improve the quality of audio in this case. And I think it's a very exciting direction to think about 3D modeling of, of audio in the way that we think about 3D modeling of graphics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you, you talk about improving the, the quality of audio, you know, drill down into the specific metric that you're looking at there. Yeah, also super difficult. <laughs> we, of course, went, went down the first way that you always do in computer vision. You optimize an L2 loss on the raw waveform. Why shouldn't it work? If you reach zero loss, you are perfect. So it's all good. Mm -hmm. The problem is in reality, of course, you never reach a zero loss. And then the question is, what kind of errors do you have? And it seems that particularly in audio, this discrepancy between the value of your L2 loss and the perceptual quality of the sound that you generate is pretty massive. So you can easily imagine that you More have so tiny... More video? More so than a video, you can easily imagine that you have like tiny deviations that just, you know, imagine you have a sine wave in audio and you have like a tiny flickering. You always stay pretty close, but you have like a high frequency signal that flickers. All of a sudden you have this super annoying high frequency noise in, mm -hmm. in your signal that we perceptually find really disturbing and can yeah. immediately say, well, this is not real. So that was really challenging. And um, we were diving deeper into this, looking into the loss functions and how to train audio. And one of the observations is that the L2 loss has a very undesirable property. Audio is basically a composition of amplitude information and phase information. Amplitude meaning how high are the peaks of the sine waves and phase information meaning where does the sine wave start? How much is it shifted, right? And then we mm -hmm. can add up potentially infinitely many sine waves and this is the audio signal that you can hear essentially a Fourier decomposition. Mm -hmm. And what we figured out is that the L2 loss, um, you can actually show that the L2 loss optimizes the amplitudes aggressively in the beginning of, of the training process of a neural network, but completely neglects the phase information. That means you try to fit amplitudes of signals where you shouldn't even fit the amplitude because if you just would shift the signals accordingly, yeah. it would solve all your problems. The L2 loss is not doing this. Inherently, it is 
keeping, uh, um, it's trying to match the amplitudes, but it's not trying to match the phase. And it mm -hmm. starts trying to match the phase at a very late time in training, which turns out to be a problem. So the very simple solution on the loss side is to explicitly optimize for this phase information. Mm -hmm. However, phase information is highly difficult because as soon as you have noise and in every real life measurement you do have noise as soon as you have noise um, this is not really reliable data so we went a step further and um, tried to implement and are we something. talking about noise in both the amplitude direction and the right, phase right, right. direction yeah absolutely i mean we try to record audio in a room and we try to get something that is as clean as possible. But you might have electrical noise because of your setup. Yeah. You might have some airflow that is, um, I don't know, going into the microphones and that is that is air pressure, right? Which is interpreted as sound. So all these subtleties really corrupt your data constantly when you have audio and you have to account for that. So yeah, we kind of shot for a solution that is on the modeling side. And I believe that is something that has been highly successful in all of deep learning, that you take some component of traditional processing and incorporate it in neural networks. The most prominent success story is certainly the convolution operation, right? Bringing convolution into neural networks has boosted computer vision. In audio, dynamic time warping is a very old traditional technique where you want to align signals in some way. And we essentially incorporate that as a neural network layer, as a fully differentiable neural network layer to solve this phase problem because this, this time warping allows you to shift components of the audio signal left or right, depending on where you want to have them. And yeah, it turned out that once more incorporating one of these traditional methods um, can have a big impact on how well neural networks perform. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so in the the problem that you've formulated, what are the the inputs? Is it, you know, clearly there's mm -hmm. some mono audio and right. the output is going to be some uh, stereo audio. Uh, but are you also, uh, you know, you localized uh, as their location inputs? Like how, what are the, right. the various inputs? Yeah, let's let's talk about this very specific application where we want to generate binaural sound, meaning okay. sound that is spatialized, where you can hear where it's coming from, but that also sounds as if you perceive it with your ears, you know, all the transformations that your ears do to the sounds. Mm -hmm. The input, clearly, as you said, is mono audio. I might have a microphone very close to, to my lips, and I just speak into that, and that is all I need as input signal. What I also need to know is the relative position between you and me. If we are in a virtual environment and you are standing two meters apart to the right of me, your voice will sound different as if you're like super close to my face and on the left of me. Yeah. So that is like the second input. Where are we in the virtual space in relation to each other? And given this input, we want to modify your mono signal based on these positions so that you receive a stereo signal on your headphones that is you know, simulating this effect of you hear it with your own ears, meaning the spatialization is correct and the transformations uh, the signal undergoes with your ears is correct as well. So that is essentially the, yeah the problem setting of, of this particular problem. What yeah. we were restricting ourselves to is one set of ears, because you can imagine ears are like fingerprints, like everyone has a different ear shape. Mm. And it's a really unsolved problem how to generalize to different ear shapes. So we use like a kind of medium ear shape, a generic ear shape that works kind of well for everyone. Um, but apart from that, it's really this full setting of having mono signal and just the positions and getting a complete binaural signal synthesized on your headphones. Okay. And uh, what is the the data set that you use for the model yeah. building? How did you collect it? What challenges did you find there? Yeah, interesting question. Um, glad you asked for that. It was a long process to actually get a, a successful capture. We started trying something where you can buy mannequins with silicon ears that behave similar to, to human uh -huh. flesh, have similar properties. And we started with that and placed just such a mannequin into a room and then had a tracking system that we can put markers on top, basically a motion tracking system, markers on top of the mannequin, markers on top of the participant who is walking around and talking to the mannequin. Mm -hmm. There were ears, uh, microphones in the ears of the mannequin, and we get sound. So far, so good. We have tracked everything, so we get all the information we need, right? The position between mannequin and speaker, and also the binaural sound. 
the initial round of this was completely <laughs> useless and without <laughs> any success. We had an AC running in that room. And if you spend like, I don't know, two hours in the room, it gets hot and the AC turns on and off and on and yeah. off. And then you could hear footsteps of people and you could hear people breathing as they came too close to the microphone. So you can imagine all these things, all these lessons that you, that you learn when you do a data collection that you never did before. Um, we improved I mean, over you that. could look we at went... that as some kind of regularization or uh, <laughs> domain, uh, domain adaptation or something. That is true. That is true. But with the premise that we want to learn metric information, that we really want to get out what reality sounds like, regularization is bad, right? Regularization yeah. is just like another prior that we impose, another assumption that we make on the signal. And ideally, we want to learn from a signal that is as clean as possible. So mm -hmm. it was really mm -hmm. worth going all the way of making a room acoustically treated, that it is okay. silent enough, and that you really just have the the, you know the default room for reverberations and these audio effects that you have when you talk in a room but no noise floor anymore so mm -hmm. um we basically went down all this way installed some acoustic paneling and improved the capture setup significantly which in the end gave us successful data and it should also be mentioned that like if you compare to how this has been solved before, you need to build an anechoic chamber. And then you would record just the transformations that are ear that your ear are doing in an anechoic chamber because you do not have room reverberations there, right? Mm -hmm. So you just capture that as a, bu as a bunch of fixed spatial positions and you have a model for that. And then you have another model where you measure room impulse responses at different places in a room. And then again, you try to stack this together. That is what traditional yeah. processing is doing. And one of the big disadvantages there was... Um, you always measure as discrete uh, spaces in time. And if you, if you can imagine you walk around, this is how sound changes, right? Doppler effect. If I get closer to some sound source or closer to a microphone, the, the, the sound waves basically compress and you get like these, uh, yeah, these motion effects. And you can never capture this in a static setup. So we were really shooting for something where we have this dynamic setup where we track a person in real time and we have moving trajectories of sound that we can model. And I think, yeah, that is probably one of the reasons that the system in the end turned out to work so well, that this is like the first time that you have this realistic scenario of moving sound sources. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I can, even with that said, I can imagine a pretty broad spectrum of complexity. Like I can uh, imagine looking at the relative position of the <laughs> participant in the mannequin in 2D space can imagine then looking at a, right. them in 3d space you know i can right. imagine then you know uh extending that to include like radial direction uh for each of the parts like how, how did you manage that <laughs> complexity factor absolutely i mean we tried the simplest thing which is restricting ourselves to a kind of donut of social interaction people usually tend to feel uncomfortable if I come very close okay. to them in, in, in conversations. Or oh, if I'm very far, I wouldn't have a conversation, but I would move closer first. So we restricted ourselves to this circle around, or like basically this donut around people uh, where social interactions typically happen. So we had a restricted input space, which clearly okay. helped. Um, one thing that we completely misjudged is a mannequin is always standing still. If you have a user in virtual reality, putting on a virtual reality headset, seeing something, hearing something, first thing that you do is look around in all the directions. Yeah. So we tried to employ our first model and it was all breaking because this was all movement that we didn't see and that we didn't account for in this simplified setting. Mm -hmm. So we actually moved forward from this donut, allowed near field captures where people get really close to the mannequin, where people move around, talk from the top and from below uh, into the ears of the mannequin to cover, to have much denser spatial coverage. And then in the end, there are other effects that you have to uh, have to think of, not just positions, but even speech direction. I have a head, mm -hmm. which is you know modifying the way I sound. So if I look in this direction, I sound different to you as if I look straight uh, to your face. Right. And these were like effects that we didn't model at all. We're like, yeah, this is neglectable, but it is honestly not. If you want to learn from the raw waveforms and that is such sensitive data, then it is not neglectable and you really need all this additional information that you can get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so talk a little bit about the, the method or approach that you came up mm -hmm. with for solving the problem. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So... <laughs> The massive advancement in uh, deep learning for audio is certainly WaveNet, which 
was this 2016 paper by DeepMind. Mm -hmm. And it has ever since revolutionized uh, text-to-speech and vocoding, meaning, you know, transferring mouse spectrograms of frequency information into actual waveforms of speech. So this is the logical starting point whenever you do something where you have generative audio and you want to generate a raw waveform. And that is what, where we also started, from a standard WaveNet, and we just used a conditioning on this position information between transmitter and receiver. And we were hoping that this would do the job. This wouldn't be like a exciting research insight, but in terms of getting the job done, that would have been amazing. Mm -hmm. But as you can expect, uh, you get a lot of distortions. You get into a lot of problems for the reasons that I told you before, that, you know, it is hard to match the face. Also, this original WaveNet architecture has been designed to produce something that is plausible, but not necessarily metrically accurate. Mm -hmm. So we were facing all these problems and from there on extending the architecture. One of the major components is that, well, if you have binaural audio, the sound takes some time to travel from me to you. And we can clearly geometrically map that, but this is never correct because what does it mean geometrically? If I look in this direction, it travels in a slightly different way. If you look away, sound has to travel around your head. So just going by distances is not enough. But what we do want to do is having some warping that tells us, okay, we are at time t when I emit the sound. What is time t prime uh, when this specific part of sound arrives at your ears? And this is what we implemented as a form of neural time warping, basically taking mm -hmm. dynamic time warping, this very traditional approach to align two time sequences, which is not differentiable, and putting it into a differentiable setting while still maintaining physical properties, meaning sound has to be causal, right? I mean, if I say something, it cannot arrive at your ears before I actually said it. It has to be monotonous. So what I say first arrives at your ears first, unless I move faster than speed of sound, which unfortunately I can't. And we have to incorporate these physical properties into the model. And this is what we essentially did. We designed this differentiable version of dynamic time warping as a neural network layer. And this enables us to maintain all the physical properties of sound, but at the same time still aligning exactly between the transmitter and the receiver. And from that point, if you have an exact alignment, standard deep learning approaches, convolutional uh, time domain convolutional architectures, do a very good job in changing the amplitudes of the signal. But the phase of the signal has already been accounted for to a large amount because, you, you know, you already warp warping. everything in the right. time domain on the right position. So you solve one of the major problems, one of the major issues that L2 losses struggle with doing. And if you start from there, essentially mm -hmm. it was a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. And so what assumptions did you need to make to make that differentiable? Um, not too many assumptions, actually, because you can formulate most of these uh, most of these components uh, in a quite straightforward way. One assumption is clearly that you do not move faster than speed of sound, but for any kind of human reasonable. conversation, that is absolutely reasonable. <laughs> absolutely. Um, one maybe slightly bigger limitation or assumption that we had to make in, in this whole architecture and this whole network is that the acoustic properties of your environment are the same. So what we cannot model is changing acoustic properties because, I don't know, you stand super close to a wall and you would have different diffractions, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, that would require you to really have like a prior on rooms and to really have a good representation of the 3D scene you are in. So what the model learns is a kind of global representation of the room acoustics you are in, but okay. it does not learn that you know, you're standing in the corner of the room and it sounds significantly different. This is something we need to solve if we want to bring this technology into virtual reality and want to have a realistic uh, impression. But yeah, in this initial work, this is something we had to abstract from and really focus on only like the global appearance of sound and getting the spatialization and binauralization correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember if we've talked about this uh, already in a, in a slightly different context, but the... Uh, the relationship between the metrics that you're training on and like perceptual metrics, um, mm -hmm. you know, from everything we've said thus far, you know, you've got a room that's kind of a fixed size and fixed uh, geometry. You've got, right. you know, the mannequin ears and you've talked at length about how sensitive the models are to those specifics. Yes. Um, it seems like you can do very well on your metrics, but still from a perception perspective, and maybe this is more, more generalization than from person to person than perception. Mm -hmm. Um, 
still have issues. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we need to make a distinction here where we have good generalization properties and where we don't. Because in the setup, mm. you always have a transmitter and a receiver. That is fundamentally different from vision, where we kind of assume if you render an image, we all see it in the same way. We do not care that maybe your eyes are slightly different than my eyes. For audio, we do care because our ears are fundamentally different. Mm. And we generalize really well on the transmitter side, meaning it doesn't really matter which kind of person is speaking. We can train on a very small amount of people a few dozen is enough, and generalize to any kind of arbitrary voice and get an accurate representation, mm. accurate reconstruction mm -hmm. of this arbitrary transmitter voice. When it comes to the receiver, of course, the generalization is, well, we have one fixed ear pair. So if you have a extraordinary ear shape, yeah. you might have something that is typically called front-back confusion, that you cannot tell if the sound is coming from the front or from the back of you. And these are issues we can really only solve if we can generalize towards ears which again uh, gives us this close connection to codec avatars. Because if we do have a realistic representation of your head and of your ear shape, of your, you know, of, of your head geometry in the end, uh, what we hope is that we can personalize the receiver side based on this ear geometries that we know from codec avatars. Mm -hmm. And how about the um, room geometry? Does, that, uh, does it gener generalize well across different types of environments? Yeah. Um, quite frankly, no, it does not. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you record audio in, in this kind of setting or you wear a virtual reality headset, your microphone will be super close to your mouth. Yeah. So you do not really pick up a lot of these uh, room acoustics anyway. And the signal you have is almost unechoic. It doesn't really have a lot of the information of the room you are in if it's very close to your mouth anyway. Um, so from that point of view, that is fine. The question is, how can we you know, transfer the system into different virtual rooms? At the moment, uh, the way it sounds is the sound of the room where we collected the data. Mm -hmm. This might not necessarily be the only room in virtual reality you want to be in, honestly. You, you probably want to be in a variety of rooms, which means we have to put some work into disentangling this part, disentangling the binauralization part from the room acoustics part. And one way to go there is that to have a better capture setup where the room where you record all this spatialized audio data, all this binaural audio data is quasi unechoic. So basically doesn't really have room responses at all. And if you have that, and then if you have at the other time captures in multiple rooms where you can learn characteristics of the room responses, you can disentangle these two effects and model them sequentially. But again, in a data-driven way, this is very hard because then the question is again, how do we get correspondences between the data we capture in rooms and the data we capture uh, in this binaural capture stage. Um, yeah, it's something we are looking into, but we do not have a solution to that yet. Okay, uh, so we've talked about um, talked about the setup, we've talked about the approach, um, we've talked about uh, metrics and evaluation a bit. Uh, where do you, yeah, we've also talked about kind of this big picture that you're trying yeah. to get to. Uh, what are the next steps from where you are you know, to get you towards the, the bigger picture? Where does this <laughs> research direction take you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, as I said, initially, my interest is working on audiovisual topics. And this binauralization, the sound binauralization paper is basically approach, an approach to do 3D rendering of sound. So where's the visual component here, right? And again, if we talk about codec avatars, encoders, and decoders, there are these two elements where we need to fuse the vision in. On the decoder side, very clearly, we talked about ear shapes. So we need to make sure that the visual information can influence the way you perceive the sound based on your ear geometry, based on your head geometry. And on the side of the encoder data, we talked about how we kind of rely on a quasi unechoic mono input, right? But what if you are in a, in a noisy environment? What if there are kids running around? We do not want to binauralize that sound. Yeah, if I'm in VR and your dog, your kids, whatever is making noise in the background, um, it's not present in the virtual environment you are in. So we need to get rid of that. So that is like another big direction where we have to think about how can we take the sensory data from the headset, use the audio sensors, the microphone that we have, but also use the visual sensors to make sure that only what you actually say, only your actual speech is transferred into virtual reality. And we get rid of all of these other noises and all of these other background signals that we are not interested in, in you know, transferring into virtual reality. 
Well, Alexander, thanks so much for taking the time to share with us a bit about what you're up to. Congrats on the best paper award. I, I guess I should ask you, um, you know, what is your, what do you think were the factors that uh, led to the judges picking out this paper for that award? I mean, the judges are probably the best people to talk to for that question. But <laughs> if, if you ask me, um, I believe it's probably this novelty of the field, you know, um, moving for audio, which is still predominantly signal processing and linear mm -hmm. time invariant systems towards data driven deep approaches, having something that is, you know, a 3D rendering uh, equivalent for audio. And I think this is just like something that has not been done before. And it is probably kind of unclear why audio is like lagging behind uh, the computer graphics community in that sense. And yeah, I believe that is probably the big impact of the paper that we yeah. were able to make this step into 3D audio rendering that is data driven and deep. That's awesome. Well, congrats uh, again on that. I'm looking Thanks forward to the the follow on. I think um, <laughs> a lot of interest in the community now about kind of multimodal, multi channel, um, combining audio, video, and other modalities. And oh, uh, absolutely, sure. Yeah, I mean, we are always happy uh, to host interns and uh, have people over who are who are interested in this work. So super happy if someone here is interested in, in this direction of audiovisual. Um, we are always looking for interested. And they should reach out to you? To, oh, <laughs> of course, to our recruiters, whatever you want. <laughs> no, it's always welcome. I, I feel it's a community that needs to grow. I feel the community really looking at this multi-model problems, this audiovisual mm -hmm. problems is too small. Uh, I, I skimmed over the NeurIPS publications and there were like nine papers that had sound in their title, which seems mm. to be too low for a conference of the size of NeurIPS. So yeah. I really feel it's a field that needs, needs to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Well, once again, Alexander, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you for having me.